World leaders are paying tribute to former U.S. Secretary of State Henry Kissinger, who died yesterday at the age of 100. Kissinger led U.S. foreign policy through many critical moments in the 1970s and continued advising U.S. and foreign governments for the rest of his life. He received the Nobel Peace Prize, but many critics called him a war criminal. Margaret Brennan looks at his complicated legacy. Henry Kissinger first arrived on U.S. shores as a Jewish refugee from Nazi Germany. Following a brief U.S. Army stint, he became a Harvard scholar, which paved his way to the highest echelons of power. Face the nation. In 1958, Kissinger appeared on Face the Nation to discuss the issue that would dominate his career, the Cold War. Over the long term, the, Russia is much more likely to be a threat to its security than, than we are. He caught the eye of President Richard Nixon, who appointed him National Security Advisor in 1969, as well as Secretary of State. Kissinger eased relations with the Soviet Union and led secret talks to reopen relations with China after a two-decade estrangement. In a 60 Minutes interview, Kissinger spoke about advising the most powerful man in the world. When you're in this job, you're not conscious of working with the most powerful man in the world. You're much more conscious of the problems that have to be solved than of the power you exercise. Kissinger also spearheaded highly controversial policies, including the brutal bombing of Cambodia, yet was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize in 1973 for helping to extricate the U.S. from the Vietnam War. Will this meeting take very long? He remained loyal to Nixon throughout the Watergate scandal and was one of the few inner circle members to escape virtually unscathed and served under President Ford. Kissinger's pragmatic policies, including support of dictatorships in Latin America, are darker parts of his legacy. Yet U.S. presidents continue to seek his counsel across nearly five decades. In an interview on Face the Nation in 2014, Kissinger argued for American leadership. Every part of the world is changing simultaneously, but it cannot change creatively without a major American contribution. Amid global power shifts, Kissinger's own views were subject to change. In recent years, he controversially suggested Ukraine cede territory to Russia, only to then call for Ukraine to join NATO. This year, he visited a rising China one last time, counseling President Xi Jinping amid cooling relations with the U.S. Henry Kissinger's strategic decisions will continue to shape the globe for generations to come. Margaret Brennan, CBS News, Washington. For more on Kissinger, we're joined by Jeremy Suri. He's a professor of public affairs and history at the University of Texas at Austin. He also wrote the biography, Henry Kissinger and the American Century. Jeremy, thanks so much for joining us. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. So as you know, as you've written, uh, Henry Kissinger was an incredibly divisive figure in American politics. I, I want to read, I think a lot of people this morning are talking about Spencer Ackerman's uh, obituary, if that's what you want to call it, for Rolling Stone uh, that you have no doubt read. And I was struck by, by this particular passage uh, that according, this is, I'm quoting from the article here, uh, the author of the biography, Kissinger Shadow, estimates that Kissinger's actions from 1969 through 1976, a period of just eight years uh, that meant the end, meant the end, quoting here, meant the end of between three and four million people, in other words, the death. That includes crimes of commission, as in Cambodia and Chile, and omission, like greenlighting Indonesia's bloodshed in East Timor, Pakistan's bloodshed in Bangladesh, and the inauguration of American traditions of using and then abandoning the Kurds. We talk a lot about his legacy. We talk about rail politique. We talk about detente. Uh, but not a lot gets said about these what people are saying are war crimes. Why do you think that is? Well, I think there has been more attention to the alleged war crimes in the last decade or two. Christopher Hitchens uh, writing a whole book called The Trial of Henry Kissinger. And I think if you talk to my students, uh, that generation, they know a lot about that or they've heard a mm. lot about that. I, I think the challenge is this, that many of those allegations have a lot of truth to them, particularly for, for Vietnam, for Indonesia, cases where Kissinger uh, was responsible for ordering military action or for encouraging it and sometimes encouraging it on the part of other foreign actors. Mm. Uh, but what's not talked about 
are what would have happened and the things that would have happened if he were not in leadership at that time. It's not clear that things would have been free of that killing, free of that destruction mm. without his leadership. So I think he's open to criticism, but I think we have to be careful not to take that too far. We mm. have to balance the alleged war crimes with uh, the accomplishments, such as the opening to China and negotiating a peace agreement between Israel and Egypt that's still a cornerstone for controlling conflict in the Middle East. Mm. These things have to be balanced, I think. Um, so, uh, you know, there are a lot of people now that will have come of age long after he left kind of the world stage. I'm sure some of your students, many of your students are, 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 part, are them, are those people. And there will not be an awareness of how much Kissinger's worldview has shaped mm. our worldview. And how we act on the right? global stage. Yeah, and how, right. His focus was about, was about world order versus world peace, was that you needed strong superpowers to keep order in place. I want to talk a little bit about the lasting elements of his legacy. You touched a little bit on it when you talked about China. Um, which would fit right into his kind of world order philosophy. But can you talk about the things that, uh, you know, the way he viewed the world and how it shaped the way we view the world today? I, I really appreciate that question. I've spent decades thinking and writing about this. He did reshape the way Americans think about the world for better and for worse. He was a child of the Holocaust, and his belief was that American power was necessary. Isolationism was morally reprehensible. American power had to be used in the world, just as you said, to work with other powerful countries to maintain order and prevent the natural entropy toward chaos and destruction in the world. That has become a central plan of the way the United States thinks about the war in Ukraine, for example, the way we thought about the war on terror, the way we think about uh, the Middle East conflict today, the way we think about Taiwan and China. The problem is, as we talked about a minute ago, uh, the use of American power to bring order often brings repression with it. And many mm. of our allies have been repressive regimes. And at times we have used force in ways that has repressed people as well. What do we learn from Kissinger? We learned that American power is necessary in the world, but I think we have to learn from his mistakes to be more careful, more discerning in how we use it, and to hear more voices not just the voices of a few powerful countries. Mm. That's the criticism that I think Kissinger leaves us with. It's the mixed part of his legacy that I think is most useful. Mm. So you wrote an incredible book on Kissinger. You spent a lot of time with him. And I just got to say this. So the man himself said that you wrote the best book on him, <laughs> but he also said something else. What did he say? Yeah, he said there were still many mistakes and that I did not understand him. And maybe well, he was right. <laughs> yeah, but, but Jeremy, so I, and, I, and we're going to have to wrap it up. But I, I think the, the, the point that you were making earlier is such a fascinating one. Um, one of the things that I think and you can correct us uh, if, if I'm getting this wrong, Professor, but um, before these illegal bombings that were done in Southeast Asia, had the United States ever circumvented Congress at that level, because we see that happening today. The president of the United States will get on television and he'll tell us, hey, we just conducted a military operation where we've bombed people that we perceive to be a threat to our geopolitical interests, not always a threat directly to the American people. But is that, for example, one of those legacies? And will we ever be able to turn the clock back from doing that? Because you make an excellent point. Sure, superpowers, of course they exist. But more voices need to be at the table. And we haven't really seen that. It's a great question. Uh, I think the use of American force by presidents, what we might call the imperial presidency, which I wrote another book on actually, uh, really goes back to Franklin Roosevelt. Roosevelt's efforts, despite isolationist legislation to get the United States, despite Congress's opposition into World War II, Kissinger drew on that legacy. What was different about Vietnam that you put your finger on so well is it wasn't just that the president and Kissinger went around Congress, it's that they lied to the American people. They said mm. they were not bombing Cambodia when they were. And that has contributed to a rapid decline in trust in government to fake news. Mm. And I'm not sure we can turn that clock back. That might be the darkest of Kissinger's legacies. Wow. Jeremy, we really so need you I here for like I a wish half you were hour. In studio for I a half know. hour. Absolutely. This is the most enlightening discussion I think we're going to have all day. Yeah. Well, invite me and I'll come. <laughs> all right. <laughs> we're inviting you. Yeah. Uh, Jeremy Suri, thank you very much. My pleasure. Thank you.